students here at MJC. Um, I got trained by uh, Ashley and Justin a couple of summers ago to be able to get data for the research that they're doing and use students, undergraduate students, to get that data and give undergraduate students some research experience in the process. So it's been really fun to learn so many new things from them. And so I would like to let you know uh, who they are and where they're coming from. So they both currently work at UC Davis. Justin Siegel is a chemistry professor there. He runs a group that studies biochemistry, um, chemistry, uh, molecular modeling, protein modeling, and uh, they apply this research to different, uh, very, very, um, uh, <laughs> very important applications, very practical applications. And so it's led to a lot of collaboration with industry, some uh, launches of businesses of his own, maybe he'll tell you about some of them. But um, he comes from the Bay Area, he did his undergraduate work at Davis in chemistry, uh, biochemistry, excuse me, and then uh, some graduate work at the University of Washington in um, biophysics, and then he returned to Davis as a professor. And Ashley Vader is a community college uh, uh, transfer student into Davis, like maybe some of you are hoping to do, and then she got her bachelor's and master's degree at Davis, and has just been stuck there ever since. She never left. She really likes it there, and has been working in Justin Siegel's lab, trying to help spread his research throughout uh, this network of colleges that have joined them. And so I would like you to welcome Justin Siegel and Ashley Vader to give this talk tonight. So this is the one that actually projects your voice and this is the one that gets it to the camera. So you get like, I guess that you can wear around your neck if you want to. You get a double mic. This one goes there. Just kind of do both of them. That one goes there. Can you guys all hear me all right? All right, let's see if I can, I can switch the projectors over. And so, well, how do we do the full screen here? My guess is that button. All right, and does that work? All right, I'm gonna come around to front because I don't wanna hide behind here. So uh, when I was told I was um, coming to Modesto to give a talk on computational enzyme design uh, at a 7.30 p.m. on a Friday, I expected five people to be here. <laughs> so that is one serious group of curious minds. Uh, and I you know, deeply appreciate your time. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> um, let's see how this is going. So yeah. All right. We'll go ahead and get started. Um, I know the talk doesn't talk about enzyme design on there. Enzyme design is a subsection of uh, bioengineering and biotechnology, and so we'll start at a pretty high level. Um, but really to kind of appreciate where we're going into and where we're from, you can kind of think, I, I often think about you know, time through dis different, you know, through over long, you know, trends over long periods of time. So we had the agricultural revolution, right, in the 1800s that led to the modern food system that we have today. You know, and it continues to develop and grow. Never, those revolutions never stop. But there's this huge spike in what happens, and then it kind of plateaus off. Then we had the Industrial Revolution. You have huge spike in mechanicalization of all sorts of different aspects of technology. And what we've all lived through very recently is the Digital Revolution that just occurred, right? Starting around the 1950s, and now, you know, projections, everything is digitized. And each of those revolutions I talked about is touching pretty much everyone's life every day in every way, shape, and form. What we're moving into now, with many, many, many consider, is the biological revolution. And that's kind of the age that most likely, if we look back 50 years from today, they're gonna mark this time in history is this is the beginning and likely the, the initiation of the biological revolution, where all of a sudden biotechnological tools are used. It's not mechanical, it's not digital. We're actually harnessing the power of biology to, in a way that's through engineering to actually impact every one of our lives. So, so how many of your lives do you think? Let's, we'll do a, we'll, because it's 7.30, we gotta be a little interactive. <laughs> And I'll play a professor's game. So I'm going to tell you ahead of time, everyone's going to raise their hand at some point. 
How many of your lives, do you feel your life or loved one's life has been impacted by biotechnology? Excellent. Now raise your hand if you do not think it's been impacted by biotechnology. I didn't, so then there's a lot of you, I saw you who didn't raise your hand. <laughs> I know who you are. <laughs> right, I was paying attention, this is recorded. <laughs> All right, well, we'll try it again. Who, who likes cheese and bread? All right, that's pretty good. Who doesn't like cheese and bread? We're gonna do this. <laughs> that's fine, you don't have to like cheese and bread. Who likes clean clothes? All right. Who doesn't, and I'm gonna say this ahead of time, I apologize to whoever's sitting next to you, but who doesn't like clean clothes? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> and whose loved one has been positively impacted by a vaccine, insulin, T-cell therapy, antibodies, you name it. All right, and who has not, has had no impact whatsoever? I'm still not getting everybody. All right. So what do those things have in common? Every single one of those applications utilizes an engineered protein through bioengineering and biotechnology. Every single one of them. There is not a food you eat today that has not been impacted by a bioengineering and biotechnology. There is not a utility you use in your household, ranging from the cushions in these seats to the washing of your clothes that has not been impacted by bioengineering and biotechnology. And there is not a, practically a medicine that you use today that has not been impacted by bioengineering and biotechnology. In fact, most of those directly, not over the broad field, directly use engineered proteins or designed enzymes even more specifically. I mean, traditionally for cheese making, rennet came from the stomach of often cows. That doesn't happen today anymore. They don't go harvest cows and use the rennet from the stomach to help process cheese. You use engineered proteins that are recombinantly produced through precision fermentation, and then you add that to your cheese to actually form the curds that you want. Those are engineered proteins. Those are not you know, from the cow or from the, the horse anymore. That is an engineered protein. If you've ever wondered why that fresh baked bread gets really stale the next day or by the end of the day, but that store-bought bread you have in the store stays nice and fluffy for like what seems forever, <laughs> if you look at the back of the label, there'll be something in there that says enzymes. They are engineered enzymes that are added to modulate the, cellulitic, the cellular properties of that bread structure to actually make sure you can maintain and trap in moisture for longer periods of time and it can maintain that fluffiness. Insulin's not extracted, you know, when you go, go into the dirt, we'll go back to the pictures here, when you go into the dirt, you know, and you get all messy, you know, and you throw stuff in the washing machine, it's not just detergents in there. The detergents actually don't do much. There's little enzymes in there that have been engineered to survive in that environment that go and break down the lipids and break down the proteins and break down the fibers that stick the dirt and stick the stains to your clothes and help them wash away. And from a therapeutics perspective, we don't extract insulin from pigs and inject it to humans anymore. That does not happen. You know? The antibodies that you have used or one of your loved ones have used, they didn't just come out of nature from somewhere. They were engineered with a specific purpose in mind. We actually harnessed the power of biology, not necessarily for what nature had intended it for, but what humanity needs it for today. But through natural mechanisms and natural ways compatible with what we do today. Every single one of these, this is a picture of, a, if you're not familiar, this is a picture of a protein, a three-dimensional space-filling model of a protein that actually conveys, like that's, that's what all of these applications use, some kind of protein. 
So for the next few minutes, I'm going to go step, take a step back because I think we can all understand like these proteins, these designed proteins, designed enzymes, subclass of proteins, we'll get into a second. Literally, there is not a day you go by that they're not used. 50 years ago, that was not true. 20 years ago, eh, sorta, kinda. But today, I guarantee you there is not a person in this room that wasn't positively impacted through an engineered protein every single day. And that's just grow, and we're just at the beginning of this revolution. And that's why I'm saying it's a revolution because a lot of you don't realize it yet that these proteins are impacting every aspect of almost every year of life. But it's about to come out of the, you know, we're, we're seeing this more and more and more and more and more of these applications need to come out. And they need to because we need to be more sustainable. We need to be healthier, more precise about what we're doing. And the only way to do that is through embracing biological systems and working with nature to achieve joint goals and not having to try to have a trade-off between nature and humanity's needs. So really quickly, we're going to do a primer. My guess is just from looking around this room, this is review. Um, this is the central dogma of biology. The DNA is the blueprint of biology. It tells you kind of what the car you want is. You know, is it a car or is it a house? You know, what are you building? Is it an auditorium? That moves into RNA. That's your component parts, generally speaking. There's many different types of RNAs, but we'll go for this one. The, it's the kind of the component parts. So you have your blueprint, and now you have all your parts to build your car. And the proteins, these RNAs often carry little bits of the protein. The protein is all these little bits strung together to build your car. And whether, you know, it's a car or a house or whatever it is dictates the different proteins, how these are strung together. The central dogma of protein biology is protein sequence structure function. So those, the DNA, RNA, protein, the DNA codes RNA to put proteins together in different orders of amino acids. There's 20 amino acids. And the DNA tells the biological system what orders to string those together on little strings on a pearl. Depending what order those 20 amino acids are strung together in, just like if you take some rubber and you take some wood and you take some metal, some instructions build you a car and some instructions build you a house. It's the same in biology. You string the same couple components together and sometimes you'll come up with a structure, and I'm showing you a little pic structure here of the, all these different protein structures. I showed you a big one earlier, but you know, here, right here, this is an antibody. You can imagine it has two little arms that go out and grab stuff. You have a virus capsid. We're all familiar with what that looks like. Holds on to genetic material and binds to your cells and injects it inside, right? Uh, or you have this little molecule here, that's insulin. You know, a little thing you can put in, modulate what your body's doing and how your body's reacting to the environment around it. Those structures, very simple, the same as a car or a house, dictate the function. So I was just talking about enzymes perform chemistry. You know, there's structural proteins, your hair, your skin, the connective tissue in your muscles. You know, those are all proteins. Whether it's a binder, such as an antibody or a virus, those are binding mechanisms. They go grab onto things. Or just simple storage proteins, places you need to store up energy. That's often why if you go to a plant, the seed is the stored energy in the protein form of that pulse or uh, corn. And that's often how proteins work. So you have these sequences that come together that form a structure. And depending on that structure, you have a different function. So sequence, structure, function. The challenge, and this is where I get excited, and this is where I think it's really awesome. And actually, I got an amazing uh, view of the, of the planetarium earlier today, and everyone always thinks astronomy is this massive, complex space. I'm going to tell you ahead of time, I would kill for an astronomically simple problem. Because a protein, I just told you, right, the DNA encodes, tells the RNA how to come together to form a protein. Well, a lot of proteins on average are 400 amino acids long. So I'm showing you little snippets here, right? This is like, what, six amino acids strung together. There's another six, another six. This is a bigger set. 
On average, there's 400 of these that are strung together that fold up into a structure. There's 20 amino acids. So that's 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 times 20 and going on for 400 times. Each one of these dots could be one of 20 amino acids, combinatorially, right? That's a hard number to wrap your head around. That's 10, I'm just gonna simplify it. I may, I'm gonna say there's 10 amino acids just to simplify it. That's 10 to the 400th. The number of stars in the known universe, universe is 10 to the 20th. It's not a little bit bigger than astronomical space. I would kill for a space set that small as a universe. The big difference is the advances in biotechnology have made it, so this universe of protein sequence, I can now go onto my computer, type a few key sequences, and a few weeks later, or a few days in some cases, I can get to any of those 10 to the 400th planets. I don't need to build a rocket ship to go to a new planet. It can be delivered to me. And every single one of those different sequences, every single one of those 10 to the 400th planets that I can uh, access now has a different function. So going back to the beginning, if you want cheese that works under certain environments or laundry detergent that works in certain environments, I can start programming in those activities. Even if nature hasn't found it, and I'm gonna be honest, Nature probably would find all of this. These are all within nature's wheel box. There's nothing unnatural. It's just the 20 amino acids connected together. There's nothing unnatural about that, right? Every one of them is accessible by nature. But either nature, I mean, you can imagine, 10 to the 400th, it's bigger than the known universe. Either nature hasn't had time to sample it yet, or that for, if it did sample it for that organism in that environment at that time, it didn't really matter. So it didn't select for it and maintain it but it might matter for us today. So you can imagine, actually, one of these things I'll talk about. Um, one of the most common uh, uh, enzymes that we use in bread making, for example, several of them come from these deep sea organisms. But you can imagine the environment of a deep sea organism, you know, a, a, a microbe found deep in a thermal vent, that environment's probably a little different than your oven. And so that enzyme didn't evolve necessarily to be perfect in your oven environment in a bread matrix. But it had some of the properties you wanted. So what protein engineering allows us to do is to go from this environment, make a few simple changes to the protein, staying with 20 amino acids, you know, totally natural in that sense, and allow it to work in the environment of the bread. We can modulate thermal stability, we can modulate specificity, we can modulate activity, we can modulate all of those properties. The challenge is that space, it's 10 to the 400th. How do you, how do you work through that space? Well, it's been changing over the decades. So protein engineering and bi the biotechnological overall revolution really started in the late 70s, early 80s. And actually a reasonable way to assess this is Nobel Prizes. I'm not saying a Nobel Prize is perfect in any way, shape, or form. There's many people that are left out, but it's an indicator to, tie, it's like to, to look big changes that happen through time. You know? And so in the 80s, really the beginning, that was the beginning of the genetic engineering capability. That was the first time we understood how to harness, read DNA and write DNA so we can actually extract it from one organism, understand what we're extracting, and insert the parts of it we want. So that was the form, that's insulin. Like that's how that started. All those applications I talked about, the, some of the very first applications was insulin, laundry detergents, and cheese making. Those were the big three that happened right off the bat. Because we knew what we wanted, we just didn't want to take it from the stomachs of cows anymore. <laughs> we wanted to take a yeast just like we brew beer and have the yeast brew our enzymes for making cheese. That sounds much better to me than from a stomach of a dead cow, right? Same from insulin. Do you want to inject yourself with extracts of pig blood? Or do you want to take a little bit of a beer brewing yeast, change it up so instead of alcohol, it produces your insulin, and then, you know, you can use that. But I'll take the beer yeast every day for two reasons. 
So that was genetic engineering, and uh, it's all, it was credited, it's interesting, when I was getting ready for the talk, I, I, this is a new slide I made. Uh, Berg, Gilbert, and Sanger, I would expect Sanger to be uh, awarded the Nobel Prize, as well as Berg and Gilbert, they were awarded the Nobel Prize, but the people that really industrialized this were Boyer and Cohen, and that was Genentech. That was really, they were the ones that founded Genentech, and they really industrialized and developed it. Uh, Neither of them got a Nobel Prize for this, interestingly enough. I was blown away by that. Cohen got a Nobel Prize for, for a different thing later, so very brilliant person, but, oh yeah. Uh, so like in theory, if we have like every single amino acid and we had a know-how on how to uh, link them together, do we make any protein um, in? It's not theoretical, we do that. That's exactly what we do. But are you gonna tell us how? how, how yeah, how so I'll get into that. Oh yeah. <laughs> so that's the beginning, right? So that's taking things from nature. To your point exactly, um, it started off, let's look at nature under a microscope. We have the power to modulate DNA. We can extract it from one place, put another bits and pieces of it. That's an engineered protein. You're not taking the full one, you take little pieces of it. And you select the pieces of it, what you want based on the physiological outcomes you see when you take apart and try it in a biological system. In the 90s, what got really exciting was moving from kind of a look and cook, like a cook, like type system, like let's look at these things, to the beginning of the digital age, right? We could actually do this genetic engineering in a computer. So we could start thinking about simulating what a naturally occurring protein would look like. And we could say, oh, now we can actually digitally look at what this protein looks like. It's not kind of blindly saying, oh, we'll take something from a piece from nature of DNA and put it in here. It's, well, what does that structure look like? And then we can use human brains to evaluate changes on a computer and evaluate the molecules on a computer to think about what would we think, what else could be possible? And so we digitized that. It was Carr plus Levin and Warshall. They won a, a Nobel Prize in the 90s for that. Well, they won it recently. They did it in the 90s. And actually, really quickly after that, some engineers, as soon as like, this became really robust, some really good engineers got interested in this. And like any good engineering, they got very frustrated because this computer modeling was way too dependent on smart people. And it's like a mind looking at the protein and being like, all right, this is, this is what I think I want to have happen. And they were like, why don't we actually, like, why don't we engineer this system so it's robust, reliable, and repeatable, right? And so the concept of directed evolution came out, where all of a sudden you could uh, make massive libraries of different proteins, uh, as it was asked earlier, by random mutagenesis. You can just take various ways to mutagenize the DNA, make massive libraries of this DNA, and apply a selection pressure in a laboratory setting for what you want that DNA to perform, that function you want it to perform. And so it's, evolu it's literally evolution, but you're harnessing the power of evolution within a laboratory setting at an accelerated rate because you're mutagenizing the DNA. And there's dozens of ways to do that that's, uh, that, that we could go into. And then you select for that function you want within a test tube. And you iterate many, 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 many cycles of that. And quickly you get to the enzymes you want or the proteins you want. And very frankly, all those applications I talked about today, I mean, while they all started here, as I talked about with basic genetic engineering, they have all utilized direct evolution because it is an incredibly powerful technique uh, that really drove the, it moved, like, moved a big step change in how fast you can get to these novel functions. Um, that was, uh, the, the Nobel Prize was awarded to Frances Arnold, one of the few women that has won the Nobel Prize, and, uh, alive and do, continuing to do brilliant work today. Uh, as well as Smith and Winter up in, uh, in Canada. In 2010, so now we're getting too early for the Nobel days. It's, it, we'll see what happens in the next 10 years. Um, Baker and Mayo did the same thing as they did in the 80s and 90s. They said, well, okay, this is great to be able to make massive libraries of mutagenic DNA and screen for it in a laboratory. Why can't we do that in a computer? Why can't we just really quickly test lots of different mutations within a, in a computer and use biophysical models to predict what that physiological function is going to be. And let's digitize directed evolution. And that's actually where I did my university, that's where I got my training and I really kind of developed, I, I guess I go back into the field to here, but 
I, that's really, I got my core uh, doctoral training really in the direct evolution era. Uh, oh, sorry, the, the computational design era, utilizing direct evolution and seeing how can we do that within a computer. And then utilizing those tools to impact society. So uh, let me give you one example story. So at this point, um, we've been, this field has been going for qu uh, quite a while now. So we've been going for 10, 15 years. It kind of started in 2005, I'd say, and it's going strong ever since. And we have launched, I've launched about a dozen plus companies. Some make, oh, is that me? No, that's not me. I've launched about a dozen plus companies at this point. Um, some of them worth billions of dollars and you know, have products all over the world. Some just starting, some have started and failed. And that's just me. There's many people that have launched phenomenal tools and technologies using this computational protein design. So I'll go through one of those stories. Um, we can happily talk about many of the other ones, though, if you want, as well as the ones that didn't work. Um, so this one starts with celiac disease. This is an issue that affects about 1% of the population, but it's a pretty severe effect when it affects it. It's basically a form of gluten intolerance, for those that are not familiar with it. That really, it's a medically diagnosable form of gluten intolerance where there's specific immunogenic epitopes, specific pieces of gluten that activate an autoimmune response for those that have, or pre, genetically predisposed for the disease, right? So it's that little piece of gluten you eat turns on an auto inflammation, autoimmune response, and then that cascades into a myriad of different effects to different severities for different people. The conso, basically what happens is you eat, you eat wheat, barley, or rye. They contain things called gluten, storage proteins, right? So their function, it's a protein, it's a storage protein. And those storage proteins are made up of these amino acids we just talked about. That's, they're all connected together. Within the amino acids, there's this little red piece. That's known to be a highly immunogenic peptide. So if you have celiac disease, that thing is like a nail. It is going to really hurt you when it goes into your stomach. Actually, your small intestine. It goes into your stomach, and it's not digested by the proteins in your stomach. It's not touched by those proteins. Because nature never evolved for us to eat this amount of gluten this often. Like, we just, it wasn't part of our system. You know, that was part of the agricultural revolution a couple hundred years ago. Hate to break it to you, humans don't evolve that fast. <laughs> we take a lot longer than a couple hundred years to evolve, right? And so while this is great, it's fed a lot of people, there is a subset of people that have a lot of issues with that and their systems are not compatible with that, that component. And so that causes major, major issues downstream. So we said, okay, I'm gonna to get to questions at the end, I think, <laughs> is that, if that's all right. <laughs> um, because I know there's some questions, so hopefully it'll be a good discussion. Um, not to dismiss your question, but. <laughs> um, so the thought behind that was, well, this is, a new, this is not a new story or a new idea. People that are lactose intolerant have a lactose pill for breaking down lactose. Why can't there be a pill for breaking down gluten, like a gluten pill or glutenate pill? The key thing is it needs to be really specific for this epitope, because unlike lactose, which is pretty much the dominant singular sugar in milk, when you eat protein, this is not the dominant protein that you eat most all the time. Usually, if you're eating a burger, let's say, with a, you know, some bread or pasta with some meatballs, the gluten's the minority of the protein there, not the majority. So it is a needle in a haystack problem. So, but the concept's simple. Why don't we just take a pill that has a bioactive enzyme in it that's targeting this immunogenic epitope and breaks it down? And then if you have it, if you have celiac disease, you can go out to dinner, you can go to grandma's house, and when they say, oh, I promise you this is gluten-free, and you see the flour flying in the back, you'll be like, it's fine, grandma, I'm gonna eat. And you can pop your pill, and you have an aura of protection for the next hour or two, and pop a couple more pills, and you'll be fine. That's the concept, right? But biology didn't evolve an enzyme for us to do that in our stomach. That didn't exist. That's not something known to occur in biology. So what do we do? So we said, well, how we, we want something that's active under acidic conditions like our stomach and is very specific for that PQ motif because it's a needle in a haystack we're looking. So we said, okay, well, let's start off by looking at things that are active under acidic conditions, because that might be harder to engineer than the specificity. So 
through great work by a lot of biologists, they actually, uh, here's a picture of a, of a nice place in Kumamoto, Japan, where uh, organisms were being sequenced and identified. I did not get to go visit this yet. I will, it's on a bucket list. Um, <laughs> particularly Kumamoto because of the story here. Um, to going to Kumamoto, Japan. And this, these are kind of acidic baths, acidic thermal vents that you know, are used all the time as hot springs now for people. But you can imagine, it's kind of like our stomach. It's warm, it's acidic, and the microbes in there, traditionally as animals fall into it, they use these proteases to eat up those, those, those things that fall in and utilize those resources of the animals that fall in there. So people analyzed these microbes that were living in here, these extremophiles, and identified some interesting enzymes that were acid active. When they identified them, they didn't actually have activity on the PQ, PQ motif we were looking for. They were active on different peptides, none of the ones that we care about here. They were active on peptides that those organisms cared about for their purposes, but not for our purposes in this story. So what do we do? We use these computational tools, and I'm listing some of these computational tools here for computational protein design. I'm not gonna go into the, the nitty gritty detail right now today. And we encode into those tools our basic understanding of chemistry, we run molecular modeling, and we use a lot of data to help iterate our design cycles. And so the students, I'm showing you a picture of an actual student, can model these proteins on a computer, simulate how changing those proteins might change their function. Then we can go into the lab, and I can literally just, I literally type on a computer the genetic sequence that I want that encodes for whatever I model in this protein. That genetic sequence is shipped to my door, I can throw it in a standard industrial microbe that over a day or two produces it, I extract it, and I can go do physiological measurements on it to understand the, the thermodynamic, kinetic, and the various other chemical properties of that enzyme. And it doesn't work every time, so there's a learn. So you take some of those models, and you take what you're doing, and you say, okay, well this data agreed with my model, and this data didn't agree with my model, and you assume the data is always correct, and you change the model to better fit your data. And then you make a new design based on that new model, and you repeat this process. So I will say the process that I'm showing here for this specific project was actually done by undergraduates in their first and second year. This is not like trained professionals in a physical, in a lab that they've been doing this for decades. All of this project was done by undergraduates in their first and second year of college. So these tools make it very accessible. And the cost has gone down substantially for these tools. And so the very first year, we're able to re-engineer. I'm showing you a binding pocket for the chemists in the room. If you're not a chemist or not deeply familiar with protein structures, I'm not gonna go into that here today. <laughs> but for those of you who are, that's the structure of the first protein that we made that really had this activity. And here's the peptide, that proline, uh, you know, uh, the, the uh, proline glutamine motif is, uh, you know, PQLP, um, and you can see all sorts of new molecular interactions that we designed in on the computer to say, hey, let's fit this really well in the binding site where it can crack it in half. And then we got a significant increase in activity from, oh, maybe it had a little bit of activity to, oh, this thing was highly active, you know, it was 150 times more active. And we actually did this a few other times and we got it about a million fold more active through various rounds of evolution. So you can imagine, you went from a pill from a million fold down to a little tiny pill. So the size of a burger down to something the size of an Advil maybe, or the, even further than that, that's more than a million, you know, it's a million folds big. But the change here would be about the size of a burger to then the size of an Advil, <laughs> right? So it's all of a sudden accessible and we have this activity. Um, I'm showing, there's a ton of data and there's a ton of publications behind this. Um, this is my favorite. Uh, if you've ever uh, been to Seattle, uh, Dick's Hamburgers is a, a classic, classic burger joint. You will see Bill Gates in line there all the time. Um, it is like the, it, it, it's like in and out here. I mean, it's like where you go. Um, it, uh, particularly after 11, that's where you go. <laughs> um, so we went there and we got a burger, a bun from there, and we got a full burger and shake. And we said, okay, well, how would this actually work? And as you can imagine, the bun, that's, that's full of gluten. So that's the amount of immunogenic gluten. Um, this other one here is, has a little bit more, you know, that's full of immunogenic gluten, mostly from the bun, 
right? And what you see is another enzyme that actually was going into clinical trials that was nonspecific. It just was grabbed from nature, traditional protein engineering, and said, hey, let's take the best nature had to offer and try it in this system, versus an engineered protein saying, let's pull this from nature, tweak it to where we want it to be, and then deploy it for the purposes we want it for. And you can see the immunogenic epitope in the bun only goes down. It, this other protein gets distracted by the rest of the proteins there. And if you go to R, is actually the plot on your right is the same as this one just zoomed in. The enzyme that we engineered, we called Kumamax after Kumamolysin for Kumamoto Japan. It's Max because the students like to call it Kumamax. I can't blame the students. It's, quite, it's, it's now called TAC62. It's not nearly as exciting, but that's okay. <laughs> um, but you, know, it went, you can see this in both cases, in physiological conditions, it went to under 20 parts per million. That's considered gluten-free. So if you ever see something that's gluten-free on it, they basically do this test I'm showing you right here, and if you're under 20 parts per million, it's considered gluten-free. So all of a sudden, you can eat a full hamburger in a bun, and it's gluten-free. We did this in people. So this is actually people data. Um, and at this point, this has moved over to Takeda Pharmaceuticals um, running these trials. Uh, and Joe is showing the placebo, and then whether or not you're on or off antacid pills, I have to show a greater than 95% because that was the limit of detection. It was probably much greater than 90. It was probably 99.9% .9 most likely um, gone as far as an actual person ingesting a meal with gluten, and all of a sudden when it goes into their stomach, these enzymes are there and remove all of the immunogenic epitopes that are there. So. That's an example of computational design. You could probably have done that with direct evolution, but it would have taken months to years to get there. And there is no way an undergraduate was gonna do that, very frankly. No offense to undergraduates, but that is detailed molecular biology that's really difficult to harness and carry out productively. Um, it's something you learn up to. This was done through the computational tools and synthetic biology tools that were harnessed by undergraduates in a few weeks. So it's accessible now, and lots of people can play around with their ideas. I wanna talk a little bit about what's coming next because it's not 2010 anymore, we're, we're in the 2020s, and you can kinda of tell a trend every 10 years, there's a step up and there's a step up. So artificial intelligence is taking over now. And it's taking over in a big, big way. In science in 2021, uh, the use of artificial intelligence in the protein engineering world and discovery world was labeled as the breakthrough of the year for, for the scientific community. And this is through a tool called AlphaFold. And what is AlphaFold? It's a tool that allows you to predict a structure. So I talked about earlier sequence structure function, right? Unfortunately, while sequence is really easy to predict because of DNA, to the code from DNA to protein, that's defined, well-established. Sequence to structure, we could sort of predict using those computational models, but it wasn't perfect. And then structure to function is the next challenge. We're trying to do both of those at the same time. Well, this is a competition called CASP that's been trying to blindly evaluate how accurate these programs are. You can imagine uh, GDT is the rank ranking they use of 90, would be that level of accuracy. Okay, you see that's a bowl of M&Ms, right? A GDT of 60 or 100 is like crystal clear. That's like 2010 vision. A score of 60, it's yeah, you can kind of tell what that is. And 30, it's really blurry. So on everything I just told you about, we were working at a GDT of 60. where we, It's blurry, right? You kind of knew it was there, but it wasn't perfect. And you had a lot of trial and error because you couldn't ever quite get it. And it wasn't a crystal clear picture that was highly accurate and highly reproducible. This little bump right here, that was through AI tools applied to digital, applied to biology, and all of a sudden, overnight, a 50-year-old problem that we've been working on since the 80s, because as soon as the genetic engineering revolution happened, everyone knew, okay, we can now access these sequences, we need to get to their function. And to do that, we need their structure. Literally overnight, all of a sudden, we had access to structure at high resolution. We could finally see. And that's just two years ago. So the advances from that have been phenomenal. How do they do that? Real briefly, you take that sequence that you care about, 
these genetic, they apply a, a search on genetic basis, databases to find all the related sequences they want you have. They apply a search to structural databases to look at all the sequences that are, have known structures that are similar to what you have. They convert this all into two-dimensional information. They feed it into a neural network to predict the three-dimensional structure. No one understands how this three neural network works, to be really clear. <laughs> they are studying this deeply. <laughs> no one understands how it works. It is like a brain. And this took millions and millions of dollars to train the neural network based on all this data that they were able to access. And I say all this data is because what's happened is when I say that they take your sequence and they look to find others that are like it, what's happened over the last de couple decades since the 90s through that genetic engineering revolution is the number of proteins that we know of in the world has ranged to a few dozen to hundreds of millions. So all of a sudden, you can apply big data approaches to biological systems. It's the first time in history we've had data that's structured and large enough to actually take all the cool tools we hear about, like ChatGPT and other things like that, and apply them to biology. Never, we've never had that, those data sets before. And overnight, the second we had that, we had breakthroughs in the field. So they were just formed. I can tell you, I was starting, you know, technological breakthroughs in, in, in my lab were, you know, we had, were launching a company every other year, every third year, because oftentimes when the projects we, uh, when we're working on a project, if it doesn't work, we publish it. And if it does work, we form a company around it. <laughs> so it's a win-win. <laughs> like, there's knowledge out there if it doesn't work, and if it does work, we'll get impact into the world. Right? The number of companies that have been launching from my lab has tripled in the last two years using these technologies. It is so much faster, so much more accurate. And that's, and we're just, I literally, this happened like two years ago. We are just at the beginning and learning how to use these tools. And the other key part is that's protein to structure. We don't have tools to go from structure to function yet. I'm still actually using the 2010 tools to go from structure to function. But at least I can get to structure more accurately now, which allows these breakthroughs to happen more and more and more rapidly. And so now we need to figure out how to go from structure to function. And that's honestly what the program here at Modesto Junior College is doing, and I'm gonna let Ashley talk about. I'm gonna do a double. Oh, oh, this is more tricky than I thought it was going to be. Can you guys hear me okay? Ooh, it's a little quieter, isn't it? Yeah. Oh boy. I'll just, I'll just hold it. I'll just hold it. Oh, thank you. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, you guys, it's really nice to see you. I haven't talked to a group of this size in a couple of years, I think. A couple of years, I used to do it all the time, so this is very exciting, and I'm, I'm really glad to be with you. Um, the problem that Justin just described and the era that we're living in, I think begs sort of two things. Two things need to come out of this and happen for us to really realize some of these visions. And one of them is a data problem. Uh, we just saw the sort of power of large data sets and what that can do. Um, and so we absolutely need data, but we also need people. Uh, if there are no people to sort of think and dream in this space and be able to work with these technologies, they will go nowhere. Uh, and so I think that might be where I kind of come in. I am interested in the people problem. Um, but the way we train our future scientists is imperfect. 
at best. Uh, <laughs> this is the oldest picture of a lecture that we know of, about 700 years ago, and the problems are exactly the same. Uh, <laughs> the students are talking to each other and maybe sleeping or crying. Um, <laughs> and so we know that this doesn't work, and, and still I'm here lecturing at you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the alternative is that we have these practical labs um, where you guys are, are working. I think you guys might be doing titrations this week. I heard a rumor about that. Uh, no one escapes the titration. Everyone does it. But doing those labs where you demonstrate some principle in science is, is it doesn't really teach you like what it looks like and what it feels like and what the work of a professional scientist is. Uh, and I think that it's really important to go there uh, if that might be your future career and if we need this workforce of people who can think in this way. Um, and so I think doing the practice of science is doing research. Uh, like that's what it is. Um, and so you guys should be practicing that in your training as you develop, probably right from the beginning. Uh, but those opportunities are a bit limited and there are several components that really make research research. And one is that there's a discovery element. Without the opportunity to discover something, uh, have new knowledge, you know, advanced knowledge, it, it, it's, it's not research. If it's just you swabbing the bottom of your shoe so you know what's on there but no one else cares about that, that's not quite it. Um, and so there also, you know, research doesn't happen in a vacuum. People, that's very, very rare for people to be doing research in their basement, in total isolation, not working with a team. It's a team sport. Um, and so there needs to be opportunities for collaboration. Um, and it's imperfect, so imperfect. Uh, the process involves multiple iterations. You have to continue to work at something, try and try again to really develop knowledge. So there has to be opportunities to try again and build from that. Um, and so th if those components are there, you know, you really have a research experience. But they're not easy to get. Like, you have to know the secret that this is something you should do. And, and as an undergrad, like, not everybody knows that secret. So I'm telling you now, um, <laughs> uh, if you're thinking about this, it's absolutely awesome. You should do it. But uh, they're, they're, they're tricky to access. Like, if you just look around the room and you look at, especially at a large institution, the student-faculty ratios are not conducive to that experience really scaling, like, and everybody getting that opportunity. And they're, they're typically selective, which can make them really intimidating to get. Um, faculty often invite their best and brightest and inadvertently most advantaged students sometimes for research experiences. So they're, they're hard to get. Um, and it's these problems that inspired this program in many ways. So I'm going to tell you about Design to Data, D2D. Um, and, and we'll kind of walk through what that whole program entails. Justin really alluded to it and set this up nicely so you have a lot of background coming in. Um, but I'm a person who didn't do undergraduate research. And uh, I was a transfer student. I transferred to Davis. I spent the two years that I did my undergrad at Davis just kind of struggling and then realized at the last moment that this was something I should have done. And it was way too late. Uh, but it gave me this sort of motivation and fire to make this happen for other people. And so uh, I, I think in some ways it's sort of a blessing. But the project here, the Design to Data project, started in the lab, just like Justin was talking about, um, with undergrads on the Kuma project. And then we turned that process, that workflow, into a class. Uh, and now we're spreading to many institutions, um, this college being one of them. Uh, and so I'm, I'll sort to tell you that story, and briefly. Um, but our research goal, I think, is truly ambitious. Uh, to get two data sets large enough to solve this structure function problem, uh, we, we really need a lot of hands on deck. 
Um, the more students, the merrier. Unlike some like typical faculty mentored research where the mentorship can be quite limited, the number of people we can serve is limited. This is pretty unlimited. Uh, and so I want to tell you a little bit about how we get that data. Um, so this is our workflow, and you saw like the design, build, test, learn. Um, but when we break that down, what does that really look like? What are the skills that you would walk away with in this experience? Um, and so you start on the computer, and you use some modeling tools to look in sort of 3D space and evaluate the protein and change it, mutate it in some way that you might think is interesting. And then we can easily, pretty easily, integrate that mutation into the protein gene. Uh, and then we make sure that that worked. And if, we, if it worked, then we sort of move into the second phase where we convince bacteria to make our mutant protein for us. And we can harvest the protein away from the bacteria. And then we can test it and see how well it worked. And that's the function. And so we can capture lots of functional data on all different mutations, the mutations that you guys might think are interesting. And um, that all goes into our publicly accessible database and we're growing that database. Um, I think by the end of the year, we may have a couple thousand data points. Uh, and so that's really exciting and that's what you would be doing. And these are the skills that are sort of true to all modern biotech in some way. So this isn't just enzyme engineering, but proteins more generally. This is the skill set that biotech employers want. And students in class say that this is meaningful. They say things like, this is the coolest thing I've done in a science class. Or this is the experience that got me my job right out of college. Or this was a real world experience that let me see how science experiments are actually conducted. And so our network has been growing. We're up to like 40 institutions now. That's really exciting. Uh, we're kind of taken off here post COVID. Um, and I'm really happy that when we look at our demographics, uh, we're able to reach students who have historically been excluded from STEM. So that includes uh, women and non-binary students, students of limited income, first generation, or underrepresented minority students. We're missing though, we're missing our transfer student population. So we are so glad to be partnering with you guys and we're really working in that space and evaluating this has made that really, really clear that that's something we should be putting our efforts behind. Um, but our goal is, is simple. It's to reach tens of thousands of students who would not otherwise have these opportunities and hopefully change how we're teaching science just a little bit by turning students into practitioners. Um, and so I'm really, I'm really honored to have the opportunity to tell you about this program and how it kind of all fits in. Okay. Thank you guys, thank you for your time. And this has been a huge team effort. Um, I'm so lucky to be a part of the team here at the Siegel Lab. Uh, and the whole lab supports this effort. We all mentor our undergrads there, um, and we have a lot of great, a great network. So uh, thank you guys, thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you.